time when there was much less crime. Ajay, the most honest man in town, was at work in a lawyer's gown. Elections came as come they would. Ajay was so committed to social good. When as a candidate he stood, everyone thought he could win so easily as he should. His only color of money was white. The people supported him all right. And Ajay knew no sin or crooked ways to win. Vijay, the opponent, distributed booze to ensure that he didn't lose. Black was the color of his cash. He squandered it with a dash. From where did he get all his dollars? Wondered all the blue and white callers. It's investment, my dear. The objective was clear. <laughs> Handsome profits and power. Vijay was flattered as most clever. When Ajay was dismayed and alone, to all and sundry influences prone, a limousine stopped by his door, a lanky man floating out above the floor. Ajay, won't you call me in? Believe me, I want to help you win. I have a small proposition to improve your winning position. You stand to gain a great deal by striking with me a simple deal. Tell me, my honored guest, in what way can you help me best? <laughs> I'm a little too straight to bend. I have no security on which you can lend. You have a great asset to mortgage. Just put your conscience in this little cage. I'll finance your victory all the way and return your conscience when you repay. The devil's briefcase, behold, the flowing sachet of cash it can hold. Inexhaustible and bottomless hole, even as Ajay's conscience went into a hole. Indeed, Ajay was elected to parliament. But then day and night, he began to lament. Will he ever redeem the mortgage and regain conscience from the devil's cage? My friend has been a member of parliament in order to serve the country with selfless devotion. Believe me, he's a very honest man dedicated to public service. But remember, when one has to succeed in every election, one has to be pragmatic and move with the times. And that is where I have found him lacking sometimes. Let me give you an example. This MP from our constituency is brilliant. He has taken part in every important debate in Parliament. He has given tangible, useful suggestions. Moreover, he's done a lot for the improvement of our constituency. But, surprise, surprise, it is doubtful whether he will win the forthcoming elections. Why do you say that? All of you praised me that I am a good member of parliament and yet you say that I may not win again. I don't say that people understand and appreciate everything that I have done. But I think even if they appreciate some of it, they will get me elected again. Hey Mr. MP, hold on. I didn't know that you were listening. Of course I am listening. Now tell me one good reason why you have doubts about my victory. Sir, your party and you, as a result of your popularity, command about 35% of the votes in our constituency. Now, in order to get re-elected, you need about 38% of the votes since the remainder will get scattered. So, all your services to our constituency and our country are of no value to get you re-elected unless you get that 3% of the marginal votes in your favour. My God, you mean my fate hangs on that 3% marginal votes? Yes, sir. 
all your record of surveys and potential to do good work is of less consequence. Winning an election is like passing an examination. Don't you know that students who know the subject better sometimes get fewer marks than students who prepare better for the exams. Preparing for an examination is quite different from understanding the subject. Can you explain? Now I am really worried about my victory. Sir, now you have to totally focus on getting those 3% marginal votes. And for that, you have to be pragmatic. Believe me, it is not practical to be a Harish Chandra in elections. It does not work. If your opponent is willing to pay 400 rupees per vote, you have to outbid by paying 500 rupees. After all, it's not for all the electorates. It's only for the marginal voters. Okay. You please advise me. You are my election strategist and I'll listen to you. To cut a long story short, he took my advice and eventually he won. You know how. One entire section of the marginal voters demanded money, selling their votes for cash. Another wanted dhotis and saris in return for their votes. Of course, don't get me wrong, these are charitable activities. After all, how else do you serve the poor? Indeed, there were others who wanted just some Arak to vote for him. What is wrong in throwing a party for the poor and the downtrodden? After all, they also deserve a kick in life. Otherwise, how can you entertain the poor? Marginal votes can make or break a candidate. In an election, you just cannot take chances. Well, my friend just couldn't afford these expenses. But how else could he win? So, his election expenses went soaring high. And now, you know, all these high expenses may or may not end up in success. But spending below a threshold surely leads to defeat. So, he had to take the help of wealthy people. When he was seeking such help, wouldn't it be absurd to try to critically examine the sources of such funds? So, obviously, he didn't. They may have come from black marketing or other not so legal activity or from corrupt practices in government. It would be stupid to check on the morals of the donors. He had to take the help of whoever was willing to extend it and be forever grateful to them afterwards. Honest to God, as you know and I know, it was all for the public good. Well, when my friend succeeded and became an MP, there were celebrations at various levels. His nobility made him grateful to all those who had helped him. It may be a question of some local license, a permit, a contract, a tender in his favor. Gratitude is, after all, a fundamental virtue. And how can you be ungrateful to people who have supported you? The legal ceiling on election expenditure is about 25 lakhs of rupees in the constituency that he contested. But he had to spend almost 15 times that about 4 crores of rupees. Now, to recover his own investment as well as to 
provide for investment in the next election, it was reasonable of him to expect some officials to take certain commissions and give the politician a fair share of it. Now, unrealistic people derogatorily and very unfairly call these kickbacks. Now remember, it is estimated that about a thousand crores of rupees were spent by major political parties in the simultaneous general elections to the parliament and state assemblies in 2004 in just one state. This expenditure can be sustained only when the returns are of the order of 5,000 crores, which means the bureaucracy has to recover from the public 50,000 crores of rupees from just one state. Honestly, dear friends, how can you blame the politician for all this? In order to serve you and me, he has to win an election. In order to win an election, he has to spend a lot of money, which is generated by this cycle. Now, those who don't cooperate with this cycle, blame it, get marginalized, and opt for short-term gains during elections. Look, whoever wins the election, those who permanently lose the elections are the people of India. That is why 40% of us are unwilling to move out of these easy chairs to go out to the polling booths. Hey, come on. That's not fair. These politicians started off with very honest intentions of working for the country and they evolved the system. Now, you either cooperate with the system or help constructively if you feel the need to change it. Either way, you don't sleep in an easy chair. Remember, democracy works 24 hours a day, 365 days in the year, not merely on the polling day. In the existing system, called the First Past the Post, FPTP, the elected representative takes everything, while the opposing candidates get nothing, even if they lose by very small margins. Hypothetically, if there are 100 voters in your constituency, and out of these, on an average, 60 turn out to vote, often the candidate who gets 23 out of these 60 votes gets elected, because the balance 37 are split between all the opposing candidates. This would mean that the elected representative really represents only 23% of the total electorate. The balance 77% have no voice to represent them in the next five years. In typical results from an FPTP election, there is a serious mismatch between the vote share and the seat share of all the parties. In the 2004 parliamentary elections in Tamil Nadu, the AIADMK BJP alliance drew a blank zero seats, even though it had polled 35% of the popular votes. The DMK Congress Left Front Alliance secured 57% of the popular votes and bagged all the 39 seats. In the national scene in 1999, the BJP obtained 24% of popular votes and got 182 seats in the Lok Sabha, while the Congress got 28% of the popular votes and yet only 114 seats in the Lok Sabha. The FPTP system has worked to the advantage of different parties at different times, but it has not reflected the proportion in which the voter has voted for them at different times. As an alternative to this, Several democracies in other countries have adopted PR or proportional representation. Let me take 30 seconds to tell you what proportional representation stands for. Under the PR system, if there are four parties contesting elections in a state and they poll 40, 30, 20 and 10 percent of the popular votes throughout the state, the parties will get 40, 30, 20 and 10 seats in an assembly of 100 in proportion to the popular votes polled. This means that every voter is represented in the assembly and not just the one whose candidate wins. However, what we are recommending for a new democracy in India is mixed member proportional representation or MMPR in short, which is a mixture of the PR system 
and the existing FPTP system. A change to proportional representation of the kind we have in mind requires no constitutional amendment. This is only a change in the representation of People's Act by a simple majority in Parliament. This will revolutionize the entire political process by improving governance and efficiency on the one hand and reducing black money and corruption on the other. Since we adopted a British model in framing our constitution, we also adopted the first past the post FPTP electoral system prevalent in the United Kingdom. If we look around the world, only some of the former colonies of Great Britain continue to follow the FPTP system of elections, while most other countries follow the proportional representation system, PR, in one form or another. In this map of 211 countries of the world, grey represents areas which do not have democratic systems of government. The democratic countries are shaded here in three colours. Red represents 68 nations which have first past the post FPTP system. Yellow represents 93 countries which follow either pure proportional representation PR or a mixed member proportional representation MMPR system, while green represents countries which follow five different other systems. The voter turnout in our countries which adopt the PR system is usually 70% and above, with the turnout sometimes being as much as 95%. The voter turnout in India is between 55 and 60%, rarely above 60%. And if you take into account the fact that about 10% of those eligible to vote do not register themselves as voters at all or are left out by mistake, the actual percentage is only about 50%. This is because in the FPTP system, a large percentage of votes are wasted on the losing candidates. Hence, there is no motivation for the voter to go to the polling booth and exercise his franchise. Whereas in the PR system, everybody's vote counts in electing the representative and hence there is motivation for the voter to exercise his franchise. In most countries where proportional representation is implemented, all minority groups get better representation in parliament. In the Swedish parliament, women get between 40 to 45 percent of the seats, giving equal representation to women. PR gives a better system of representation for women. In fact, PR will give better representations for all kinds of scattered minorities across the country since they will get a cumulative strength based on the votes polled in varied constituencies across the country or across the state. In the corruption ranking for the world, among the top 22 least corrupt countries, 17 follow one form or another of PR. Among the newly independent countries, South Africa, which follow PR, has a rank of 41. Well, compare that with India's ranking at 72, Pakistan at 84 and Bangladesh at 125 all following the FPTP system. Another important comparison may be made between the situation in South Africa and that in India. We in South Africa have not only differences on the basis of race, but also very strong tribal loyalties. Due to PR, South Africans, whether they are black or white, and belonging to a wide variety of tribes, are happily forced to work together on issues that divided them during the century of apartheid. In a uniquely short period of time, we have managed to bury our differences during long bitter struggles and national strife. We can confidently ascribe this at least partly to PR, through which all our tribes and races have the satisfaction of being represented in Parliament in an equitable manner, and we have learned to work together as a nation. In New Zealand, we had adopted the British first past the post electoral system. In 1996, we changed to the proportional representation system and have since accomplished giving far better representation to our minorities. Our Maori people, who are similar to the scheduled tribes of India, have benefited more from the PR model than from our older model of reservations under the FPTP system.
All this sounds very encouraging for India to adopt as we may find a practical way to cement the differences between the varied caste groups, linguistic groups, religious groups and even political groups to function in a coordinated manner for the benefit of the country. Moreover, in the current FPTP system, national parties are getting marginalized because many states are under the dominant influence of regional parties. PR will restore the unifying influence of national parties without sacrificing the role, the power and influence of regional parties. Only three states of a size sending 15 or more MPs to the Lok Sabha today, that is Rajasthan, Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh, witness a direct contest between the BJP and the Congress. In West Bengal and Kerala, the direct contest is between CPM and Congress. In all other states, one of the three national parties, or all of them, team up with regional parties. For instance, from 1991 to 1999, we see a gradual decline in the number of seats won by the national parties in the Lok Sabha by 20%. In the same period, the number of Lok Sabha seats won by the regional parties have grown by 300%. What miracle can proportional representation perform to reduce corruption in Indian environment? The current FPTP system has contributed to the vicious cycle of votes dependent on black money, dependent on crime and corruption, dependent on political power, dependent on votes. A changeover to the PR system will break this vicious cycle. Politicians are not villains, they are victims. Victims of a system that has enslaved them and made them behave as they do. Most of our elder politicians have started their political careers genuinely wanting to do public good and to be role models as honest statesmen. But the FPTP system is so corrupt that no politician can hope to win an election without substantial help from unaccounted money. It erodes their self-esteem. Believe me, the players in this game of politics are basically honest people. No, 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 they are. On the contrary, it's the rules of the game that have to be changed. If the rules are changed, the same people will be able to govern the country with the least levels of corruption. In the PR system, since politics will become issue-based, Politicians will not have to spend exorbitant amounts on winning elections. It would become impractical to buy up the entire country or even a state for the party. Therefore, levels of black money will go down. The wellsprings of corruption will get stopped. What will be the benefit for minority groups in India under the model of PR? Yes. If there is a party that does not command a majority in a pocket but has widespread following throughout the country or throughout a region, in the FPTP system such a party does not get represented either in parliament or in the assemblies. On the contrary, in the PR system, the minorities will have their voices heard both in parliament and the legislature. A party with scattered public support might secure 15% or more of the votes in every constituency across the state. But it may not get any seats at all due to the lack of majority in any constituency. On the other hand, small parties with a support base only in a few constituencies having 35% or more of vote share in those constituencies may secure a few seats even though they may end up getting only 5% of the overall vote share in the entire state. In short, the FPTP system penalizes parties with broad but scattered public support and favors locally powerful candidates who derive their strength typically on the basis of caste, family clout, muscle and money power. This results in even big parties being forced to nominate locally powerful candidates who have notoriously criminal and corrupt records. Why do you think proportional representation will lead to women's empowerment in India, whatever may be the experiences of other countries? In the proposals that were made earlier on women's representation, one-third constituencies were expected to be reserved for women on a rotational basis, causing 
many complications. On the contrary, parties will have to implement an internal democracy by which a certain percentage of the seats in their party lists are surely allotted to women under the PR seats. This will automatically ensure that women are given their due importance and also that a larger number of women will get elected to parliament and the legislatures. Well, there seems to be an inherent weakness in the PR because it will eliminate the direct relationship of voters of different constituencies with their elected representatives. Everything will be so impersonal without any vote being cast for any individuals, disrespecting the affinity of the candidate to the electorate. This is precisely why we are recommending a mixed member proportional representation system or MMPR instead of the pure PR system. This system will work in a manner wherein half the number of elected representatives to parliament or state legislatures will be elected on the basis of the conventional FPTP system. Hypothetically, if there are 100 seats in a legislative assembly, these 100 constituencies will be subject to a new delimitation by which there will be 50 constituencies, perhaps by a merger of two existing constituencies into one. These 50 constituencies will elect MLAs in the same way as in the old FPTP system. Each voter will have two votes, one vote for the candidate in his individual name and the other vote for a party without the name of any individual. Thus, a voter will have the choice to vote for a particular candidate based on his or her integrity and reputation, irrespective of the party to which she or he belongs. The same voter may vote either for the same party or for a different party while exercising his franchise for the party vote. After accommodating the 50 candidates who have won based on the FPTP model, the balanced 50 seats will be allotted on the basis of PR, on the basis of compensatory allocation of seats. The example would be, if one crore of people had voted in the 100 member assembly and the result for example is as follows. Party A has won 27 out of the 50 seats for which individual candidates had contested, but it may have won 40 lakh votes in the name of the party. 40 lakh votes mean 40% of the total votes polled and hence the party is entitled to 40 seats. Since the party candidates have won 27 seats, the balance 13 will be given as compensatory PR seats. These 13 are to be chosen from the list of candidates given by the party. The party list would have prioritized the names of candidates in the list which would have been published in advance. Thus, for getting 40% of the votes polled, Party A will get 40 seats out of 100, 27 of them would have been directly elected and the balance 13 under the PR. Similarly, Party B, which probably has a widespread presence in all constituencies without concentration on specific areas, may have won only 15 seats with a popular vote of 30 lakhs. Since 30 lakhs will entitle the party to have 30 seats, 15 additional seats will be given to the party on the basis of the party list. Thus, every party will have a mixture of members elected directly by the constituency and those who are selected out of the party list without contesting direct election. If hypothetically party C has won 8 seats with a popular vote of 6 lakhs, it will not be entitled to any further seats because it has already won two seats in excess of its popular vote. But the two additional members will be retained as members of the assembly by increasing the strength of the assembly to 102 instead of the originally stipulated 100. When no party obtains a legislative majority on its own, coalitions and alliances are the only way to form a government. In the FPTP system, a coalition government formed on the basis of legislative numbers, in fact, may not represent the majority of the voters. On the contrary, a coalition government formed on the basis of the MMPR electoral model must and will have the electoral mandate, since otherwise they will not be able to form the government in the first place. 
That is the crucial difference between the FPTP and MMPR-derived legislatures. Well, PR is not entirely a new concept being discussed for the first time. In 1999, the Law Commission of India in its 170th report states, a combination of the present FPTP with a list system may best meet our needs. By list system, the Law Commission meant the PR system with a list of candidates prepared by the parties. Indeed, the CPIM committed itself to electoral reforms, including PR with partial list system, in its 1999 election manifesto. At the other end of the political spectrum, in 1996, the former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee reflected the BJP support when he said, The present FPTP system weakens the representative character of elective bodies. This anomaly needs to be corrected by introducing proportional representation in at least 50% of the total number of seats in the Lok Sabha and the Vidhan Sabhas. Some of the regional parties have also expressed support including the DMK in Tamil Nadu. For that matter, the MDMK manifesto in 2004 said that the party would work towards getting PR in the assemblies as well as the Lok Sabha. May I also mention that the Akali Dal and the Shiv Sena also support PR. You're right. The change looks more complex to understand than it really is. However, to get full advantage of the MMPR proposal, the democratic functioning of parties themselves becomes important to ensure that people with political ideology, commitment to principles, respect for the rule of law, and a broad understanding of governance are at the helm of the affairs of the political parties. The parties have to become dynamic engines of democracy. For this, we need legislation in India on the lines of the Political Parties Act in Germany. The law should govern matters related to membership, regular election of office bearers by secret ballot, democratic decision making and open debate on policy options, public auditing of accounts and fair and democratic choice of candidates of the party's list for PR purposes by members or their elected delegates through formal procedures and secret ballot. Will this not amount to too much interference with the internal affairs of political parties? Should we not keep away from the internal bickering and the management problems of political parties? Should law interfere with them? A democracy can flourish in true sense only if the participating parties also function with democratic norms. For example, the list of candidates to be finalized should be on the basis of the registered members of the party or an internal electoral college electing them in party elections. The office bearers of the party should also be elected. This is not to decry the leadership and the power centers which may act with the best of intentions for the country and may often choose candidates with great wisdom. The point is that it is against the very spirit of democracy to have a system of autocracy in the governance of political parties. Even though the faces of governance change, the political culture does not. People vote for change in anticipation of change in the culture of governance. Unfortunately, that does not happen because rival candidates of different parties are often chosen on the same common criteria of dominant caste in the area, money power and muscle power. It has become a system of compensatory errors. Only with the inner party democracy and with proportional representation, this state of political affairs can change. A candid reflection of the frustrations of the Indian electorate is that about 60% of incumbent candidates lose the elections in India, almost in every election. Compare this with 90% of the incumbents winning the elections in countries like the United States. And yet, Given the distortions of our political system, such large anti-incumbency reaction in India does not really change the way we are governed. After all, nobody loses when India wins.